Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the climate change. Probably the most controversial topic and the most divisive topic I could have picked. Because, you know, why not? Anyway, so this is actually based on a very recent paper published in the Nature magazine that talks about a very interesting sort of a, I guess you can call it a discovery, but more of a summary. And specifically what this particular paper does is it doesn't just talk about um, a single region uh, where maybe ice has disappeared or it doesn't really talk about some other regions where ice may have actually increased in size. It essentially combines the data from various universities, from various studies and puts it all in one single map to discover what's really happening to the ice shelves and the other reserves of ice on our planet to see what's maybe happening to it. Now, you can probably guess what we've discovered though. And honestly, um, whether you believe that global warming is a thing or if you think it's a conspiracy, the science behind this shows the following. Let me just show you the picture. This is the summary from their study. Every single circle you see, or every single sphere, I guess, because it's technically three-dimensional, shows you how much ice each region lost in billions of tons, gigatons. There is, however, at least one region, specifically this right here, uh, close to India, that has gained uh, some ice. Now, we don't really know why some regions lost ice and why some regions gained ice, but we do have the global average right here. And this is a global average from the last 50-ish years, actually over 50, since 1961. This is all based on both direct observations and different types of measurements from pretty much every individual region combined into one. And the summary is that we lost basically 9.6 trillion tons of ice. Okay, so what exactly does that compute to? How much of ice is that? In other words, if I were to take Himalayas here and then somehow melt 368 billion tons of ice, this would raise the level of global um, water by approximately one millimeter. So if 368 um, gigatons translates to one millimeter, how much does 9 trillion translate to? Well, that's easy to find out. 9.6 trillion divided by 368 billion gives you something around 2.6 centimeters. So this suggests that in the last um, 50 or so years, the water level increased by about 2.6 centimeters or roughly around one inch uh, on average around our planet. And that's actually exactly what we've discovered uh, based on observations from different locations. Now, we've also discovered that um, pretty much all major reserves of ice, such as, for example, Antarctica that you see right here, or um, Greenland, which is right here. So here's Greenland going through its summers. Uh, all of these regions have actually been losing a lot of ice every year. In Greenland alone, every single year in the last decade or so, um, approximately 240 billions of tons of ice were lost. And that suggests that uh, this would raise the level of water by about half a millimeter per year. Now, Greenland alone, even though it's not super big, actually stores a lot of ice. And if you were to melt all of the ice in Greenland, the uh, water level around the world would actually raise by about seven meters. Or what is that in feet? Like 20, 22 feet or something like that? And that's a lot of water. Um, now, what about Antarctica? Well, if you were to melt all of the water in Antarctica, the water level around the world would actually increase by approximately 58 meters. That is a lot. That's close to about 190 feet. And that, of course, means that some parts of the world will be totally covered in water. Now, we can actually try to simulate some of this in Universe Sandbox by, by moving our planet way, way closer to the sun so all of the ice melts. And then just seeing what happens to some of the uh, seashores here. And by melting all of this ice that we had here, this is kind of how the Earth would transform. Like, for example, Florida is gone now. A lot of other parts of the world are actually also gone, and it seems that um, they're still disappearing, actually. And this is huge. This is basically if you melt all of the ice. And that's, of course, something that, if it ever happens, is going to be devastating to many different countries around the world, because a lot of those countries don't uh, have much elevation above sea level and so for example the place where i'm living right now is most likely going to be completely underwater 
So yeah, that's something we might want to actually avoid. But at the same time, we don't expect this to happen just yet. This might take a while before it actually does occur. Interestingly though, look at that, Australia now gets its own miniature sea. But what else do we learn from this particular study? Well, first of all, um, a lot of the ice, um, like I said, is actually stored in Antarctica, but pretty much every major study discovered that both Antarctica and Greenland is losing a lot of ice every single year. And even though there is a lot of ice stored pretty much everywhere around the world, it's really Greenland and Antarctica that we are kind of worried about. And even though there are some regions that actually did receive extra ice, like I mentioned, the one here um, in Southwest Asia seems to have gained a little bit of ice. Overall, on average, pretty much every region lost a lot of it. And in a lot of these cases, in a lot of these studies, uh, because very advanced uh, digital 3D uh, topography models were used, the results are actually very accurate. And even though there's still going to be some skeptics, specifically politicians, that are going to try to say, well, how accurate is this? Because so many studies are saying pretty much the same thing, it's going to be really difficult to wiggle out of that one for a lot of politicians. And because this study used so many different resources to try to analyze this data, and because they actually combined data from so many different researchers, it's actually quite comprehensive and probably one of the most advanced to date. But this, of course, doesn't provide the causes. And that's really where the argument, of course, usually starts. What's really causing these changes? Are these human-made or is something else entirely responsible for kind of warming up our planet and sort of removing the ice from our planet and turning it into water? Well, I guess um, this study doesn't actually answer that. It just gives you the results showing that we lost over 9 trillion uh, tons of ice and the worldwide water levels have increased by about 2.6 centimeters or about one inch. And that's where you have to start I guess doing a little bit more research. And I think one of the best uh, visual tools that I've discovered that allows you to maybe make your own conclusion on what's really causing this comes from Bloomberg. And I've actually used this tool in one of the previous videos uh, and I demonstrated how this works. But let me show you again. So this line here shows you the observed increase in temperature since 1880 until approximately 2015. Now, this is uh, kind of an average from various locations around the world, and of course you can debate on whether this is accurate or not, but that's not really the important part. The important part is seeing what else this shows you. The next line shows you the orbital changes of our planet, and as you can see, um, there is actually very little correlation between the orbital changes and the observed temperature. This is solar activity, and once again, as you can see, um, solar activity and the observed temperature also doesn't really correlate very well. Here's various volcanic activity, and um, there actually have been some major uh, volcanic eruptions in the last 100 years. You can actually even see them right here. And once again, um, not really correlated with observed temperature. Here's all of them together, and all together you kind of see that natural factors don't unfortunately explain the observed increase um, in temperature around the planet. The land use uh, around the planet um, is also included here as is the ozone layer that you can see. And we also have um, aerosols released by various activity around the planet. So for the most part, aerosols actually do decrease the temperature because aerosols on average actually either reflect or refract light from the sun, uh, specifically infrared light that comes and warms up our planet. And then we get into other things, like for example, greenhouse gases. And this is not just CO2. Remember, CO2 is actually one of the weakest greenhouse gases. There's a lot of other stuff that we currently produce today that is way more powerful than CO2. There's a lot of greenhouse gases that unfortunately are completely uncontrolled. But what's interesting here is that there does seem to be a bit of a correlation between greenhouse gases and, of course, the observed uh, warming effect. And then when you combine all of these human activities together, and specifically if you actually add them up, they seem to surprisingly correlate really well with the observed temperature. Now, remember, this is correlation, not causation. This is where you, as a thinker and as a viewer, have to make your own decision. So is this really humans causing this, or is it some kind of a natural thing? All factors together is also here, and this is kind of what it looks like. And you can see that the actual observed um, effects really highly correlate with everything. Now, what does this suggest? Well, this suggests that we humans seem to affect 
a lot of things on this planet. And this warming effect um, is maybe what's causing those ice shelves to melt. It's once again not a causation, it's correlation. And this is really how this particular study helps us resolve the problem of missing or disappearing ice around the planet. Now, um, I guess some people might still not be convinced by this and some people might not really care, but well, this is just today, right? Remember, we're still losing a lot of ice every single year. And despite some countries actually proposing things like carbon tax, which was recently introduced in Canada, that's just not really enough. As a matter of fact, it's maybe not even going to be that efficient because think about it. CO2 or carbon dioxide is actually one of the most minor greenhouse gases. There are actually a lot more other gases uh, that are produced by people, by human activity, that are actually way, way, way more powerful. So despite carbon tax being a good first step toward trying to stop this from happening, it's just kind of inefficient. It's, as a matter of fact, not really enough. And so this is one of those topics where I personally think that education is the best weapon. Essentially, understanding how various gases, and of course, our use of those gases, affects the world is really important. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, let's take methane, for example. This is a typical gas produced by various farms around the world. And because we all consume farm products, we have to be really aware of how our overconsumption of certain products may actually inadvertently um, affect the planet in a very negative way. At the same time, things like nitrous oxide, which is a very powerful uh, greenhouse gas, is often produced by uh, very typical chemical factories. And a lot of those chemicals are almost never controlled. So maybe not using certain products to the extreme and being a little bit more conservative with the consumerism might actually help us. Now, I'm not saying don't go and buy everything you want to buy. I'm just saying be aware of this because every single action that we do today unfortunately influences the atmosphere and, of course, the effects of the atmosphere of our planet quite dramatically. Here's actually what uh, PM 2.5 pollutants look like right now, and these are usually very dangerous to your health. But anyway, that's another story for another day. For now, though, I guess what I want to leave you with is the links. I'm going to provide all of the links for these apps and for specifically this simulation in the description below. You can check it out for yourself and come to your own conclusion. And also, I'm going to leave you with the publication that I mentioned in the description below as well. Now, I know that this is a very divisive topic and I guess some people get really passionate about this, but this is one of those things where science is actually basically telling us only one thing. It's happening. It's really happening. And unfortunately for us, it will probably have a major impact on the planet in the next few hundreds of years. Okay, maybe not this extreme, but pretty close to that. Anyway, on that note, thank you for watching. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about the climate change, the disappearing ice, and of course the simulations that you can use to either teach someone about this topic or specifically discuss this with someone who doesn't actually believe in climate change. And most importantly, subscribe if you still haven't because there's going to be a lot more of these videos coming in the future. And anyway, on that note, see you tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out. And as always, bye-bye. And yeah, it looks like I basically drowned the whole planet in water. So this is what our planet would look like if it was basically covered in even more water than we have today. North America kind of looks like a really cool looking long continent. And most of Europe turned into islands. It's actually an archipelago now. And the biggest continent and the winner here is Asia, which is actually kind of interesting. A lot of China is still there. And if you're from Australia, I'm really sorry, but there's basically nothing left.